Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Jeb, and I'm an alcoholic. The three most important words you need to know about me. Uh, God removed me from alcohol on April 18th, 2013, but that wasn't my original sober date. I have a sponsor that knows she's my sponsor. I um, sponsor both men and women all around the world. Some of them are even local, which is uh, nice. Um, currently, I have 18 sponsees that are all in either different parts of the big book with me or they're in the traditions or I'm their service sponsor. Um, And most of my sponsees are sponsoring other people. And that's the importance of passing it on. Um, I remember that was the first thing my sponsor said to me when I came in is we're going to do this work together. And I only ask that you pass it on when we're done. Um, So I am active um, in my home group, my in-person home group. I'm an active member um, here on this platform. Um, I facilitate an open speaker meeting on Sunday evenings at 6 Eastern Standard Time. Um, It's in the chat, the information about my group. Please come join us one night. I also set up a WhatsApp page where I can post Um, flyers every day, 25 to 30 flyers. And then I just extended it to posting it in like a dozen different WhatsApp groups. And that I call that my pandemic service. um, Because it was something I felt that would be lovely for people to get flyers and know what's going on um, in the rest of the world. I just rotated out of six years of being in general service with three different positions. I'm taking a little break. Um, and I live in the spiritual disciplines of steps 10, 11, and 12. Thank you, Tamara, for asking me to speak. It's an honor. Thank, uh, and again, thank you to the co-hosts who enable this meeting to happen and to all the people that came to support me. Um, I love every one of you. And to those I haven't met yet, I'm looking forward to your friendship as well. So as they say on page 58, I'm going to tell you what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now. Um, I was restless, irritable, and discontented before I even picked up a drink. Um, You know, I could not control my emotional natures. I was having trouble with all my personal relations. I was living in the bedevilments, and there I saw myself on page 52. Thank God the antidote to those bedevilments were the ninth step promises. I'm that Jay Walker, and I'm also the real alcoholic on page 21. I was always insanely drunk. You know, uh, when I first um, started working in the city, I think I was about 18 or 19 years old, and people would say, um, would you like to go out for a drink after work? So I'd go with my coworkers, and, you know, they'd have their one or two drinks. They'd say goodnight, and they'd get on the railroad and go home to their families. But I got stuck on the chair almost like it was crazy glue. I couldn't get off the chair, and I couldn't stop ordering drinks. And that was what my life was turning into. Once I have one, I can't stop. You know, I later found out that I was bodily and mentally different than my fellows. You know, thank God for Silky, who explained in the doctor's opinion about my abnormal reaction to alcohol, my allergy and my obsession. You know, my mind was as sickened as my body. Um, I had no mental defense against the first drink, and I didn't understand when I got here what they were talking about. It's the first drink. You know, I'm like, oh, no, it's the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, whatever, but it's not the first, but it is the first. Um, I always felt like I was drinking against my will. You know, alcohol got in the way of every part of my life. I was always filled with fear. And I lied about nothing important as easily as I would take a breath. I didn't know what that was about either. You know, when I was seven years old, um, at that time, my mom, um, well, she was an addict till she died, but she was um, addicted to pills. And she took every kind, you know, it was the early 60s and diet pills were the craze. And so she was on ups, she was on downs, and she was on um, uh, sleeping pills. 
And she used to drink cough syrup all the time. And I didn't know what that was all about. I do know what it's all about today. But that was easy for her to just go into the pharmacy and get that. So um, she was on her way. This was the first rehab that I would remember her going to. So she was on her way to rehab for a month. Um, as a matter of fact, I spoke at that rehab about 20 years ago in Manhattan. It was called Payne Whitney Psychiatric. Um, I do remember when I visited her, she was very proud to say that she had um, uh, cut a place in her pocketbook where she stuffed her pills or she put her pills in her bottle of night cream and she was very proud of herself. And I was like, Oh my God, you know, even at seven, I knew she was telling me something that shouldn't be. And so she went away and uh, I only had one aunt and uncle in this country. So my brother went to my aunt and uncle and my mother decided um, since I'm seven years old and school is two blocks away that I should stay in my building to be babysat for by an upstairs neighbor. And, you know, after school, I would go there. However, my mother's friend who lived upstairs was working. So the person babysitting for me was her 14-year-old son. And of course, you know, for a month, um, he used me as practice. You know, um, he sexually abused me every single day. But that's not why I'm an alcoholic. Non-alcoholics get sexually abused as well. I'm an alcoholic because once I pick up that drink, I cannot stop. Um, anyway, alcohol was my solution till it stopped working. And I would um, later in life change my tune about my mother. You know, I was an ungrateful brat. My mother made all my clothes for me. I was the most well-dressed girl in school, um, but I was ungrateful. You know, I was a girl that wanted to buy retail. I wanted to buy all the cool clothes. Um, and... You know, she suffered her own traumas when she, by the time she arrived to America, she was a part of World War II. She had her own traumas with the German soldiers, even though she came from South Africa, North Africa. She called it the German occupation. I didn't know that was the same thing as the Holocaust back then, because she never said that word. Um, so I had to stop blaming her. She was sick and suffering, and she did the best she could. So I went to college, but I only lasted two semesters because I started drinking at 14. And by the time I was 19 years old, I was a blackout drunk. But instead of stopping drinking, I left college. This would be my pattern throughout my life. I would do anything but give up alcohol. Um, I was married. Um, I married my husband under false pretenses. Um, he used to talk to me when we were dating about um, the stock market and him playing bets in the stock market. It was called puts and calls. You, we would either bet in a certain time frame that a stock would go up or a stock would go down. So I figured you have to have money to bet so foolishly like that. So I thought he had money and I wanted security. So I married him. But I was the worst wife you could ever have. I was a nightmare. I am physically, emotionally, and spiritually violent. I always put my hands on my husband. Um, and I, I couldn't, like, once I started drinking, all bets were off of how I would behave that night. And so my husband, who never raised his voice or a pinky on me, when I put my hands on him, I guess he did what normies do. He called 911. And so we had a domestic violence unit that were in my home so often. And that's only because my husband refused to press charges against me. But I gave them a nickname, very fitting for them. Um, the one cop that was super tall, he became effing large. <laughs> and his partner by default became effing peewee. So, and I called them that to their face and there was nothing they can really do. Uh, and I felt, I really felt sorry after I did some of the things I did. Um, I know that one night um, he came home from work and there were maybe two or three days worth of dishes in the sink and he mentioned it to me. Well, that was the worst thing he could have ever done to me is point that out because uh, the jerk that I am, I went to the sink and I took every dish and I broke it on the floor and I said, look, now there's no dishes. And I walked away from him. And I sat on the couch and I continued to drink. Probably the worst thing I ever did to um, my husband was um, 
he was a sports memorabilia collector. And the whole time we were dating, I knew, of course, his favorite team was the, and this is the 80s. His favorite team was the Boston Celtics, and his favorite player was Larry Bird. And we had in our home an autographed uniform from Larry Bird, and it, it hung um, in a glass case. And one night I was just so bleeping drunk that um, I just wanted to do something terrible to him. And it didn't matter what he would have said. Nothing, nothing would have mattered. This is who I am. I'm that mean violent girl and so I took a hammer and I broke that glass and then I took a butcher knife and I shredded that uniform and the minute I was shredding it I felt remorse but I I had too much pride to stop and say oh my god what am I doing I'm so sorry I felt so guilty but I did the same thing I always did I walked away from the situation I sat down and I continued to drink. Yeah, you know, I worked for, um, you know, and I was also, I was a negligent mother. And my first sponsor, when she met me, said, don't qu get it twisted. Negligence is abuse. So I was not capable of helping my daughter with homework after school. Dinner was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or tuna fish sandwiches. It was the best I could do. Um, I couldn't give her a, a bath at night or read her a bedtime story and I'll forever be grateful to my husband who was both mother and father to her and I used to cry sometimes because you know she would come over to me and, and she'd say and I'd be laying on the couch either hungover or whatever and she'd say mommy why don't you ever play with me and I said to her there are some mommies that play and there are some mommies that don't play I'm the mommy that doesn't play and that absolutely killed my soul to say it and so of course I had to drink more you know all of that behavior all of that guilt and shame it just made me want to drink more so I wouldn't have to feel it um and I worked for IBM which was the best company in the whole wide world I had been working for them since the late 70s and I always had bosses that said to me Deb you're a great worker when you're here you know, the one you're here was like the knife in the gut thing because they were right. I could not come to work all the time. I had to call out sick because I get blackout drunk or I'm still drinking in the morning. And so I can't go to work. Um, and, you know, I, I got mixed messages from IBM means I've been moved. That's the acronym we use because you're either promoted, um, you know, or getting great pay raises every 11 to 14 months. And so with all they're telling me about my being absent all the time, I'm still getting promoted. I'm still getting raises. They even gave out rewards. I've gotten gotten great rewards. <laughs> it, so it was a mixed message and I never took them seriously. And then my last boss that I had, the first thing he said to me when I met with him in his office is, I know all about you. If you ever call out sick again, I am going to send you your things in the mail and I'm going to fire you on the phone. And I had a, a bad feeling in my stomach that this was true. It was He would definitely do that. And I never wanted to leave IBM. I loved the work I did. I was in human resources. I was a human resource manager. I was in charge of employee relations as well as recruitment. Here I am counseling other employees and I'm the one that's sitting here with the problem as well. Um, so it was, a, it was a Sunday night and I'm sitting on the couch. And of course, I still believe the lie that I can stop once I start, that I can control my drinking. And I sit there and the TV's on. I have no idea what's on the TV, but I'm just sitting there and I'm looking at the clock and I'm saying, I'll have my last drink at nine, 10, 11. Before I know it, it's morning. I'm still drinking. I don't want to lose my job. So what do I do? I decide I better come up with a good excuse where he can't fire me. So I decide I'm going to pretend I have an accident and 
you know, my sponsor calls it my alkological thinking. When my mind starts going, it sounds really good to me. So I say, I'm not only going to tell him I had an accident, that I fell down my care, my staircase, but that I fell face first. So the first thing I did was I went onto the rug and I rubbed my face against the rug maybe 50, 60 times. I had a rug burn from up here to down here. That was enough. Then I went out into the staircase and I just kept banging my shoulder till I dislocated it. And don't worry, I didn't feel a thing until I sobered up. Um, and it was painful. And then the next thing I did is I walked down to the bottom of my stairs and I hit my head against the wall till I tore skin. If you were to have seen me that day, you would have said, oh, my God, she looks, I, I looked horrible. I look like I fell down the staircase of the Empire State Building. I only have six steps. How anybody bought that is beyond me. But that's what made sense in my head at that time. And then I just laid at the bottom of the stairs and I called my husband for help. We went to the ER. They put me in a sling. They gave me, you know, ointment for my face um, and they gave me um, some pain medication and they sent me home and he called my boss and that brought me two weeks away from work. So, of course, in two weeks, I drank every single day. It's going to be harder and harder to stop drinking when I have to go back to work. And that's exactly what happened could not go back to work after those two weeks. And I thought, well, maybe I'll try one more lie with my boss. So I said to him, I think it was a little too premature to come back and that I'm still in a lot of pain. I can get a doctor's note. And he said, don't bother, you're fired. So I lost the best job I ever had, I ever loved due to my alcoholism. Uh, and I was a bar drinker. And it was a very dangerous place for me and being a blackout drunk is I was always leaving the bar with strangers. I was coming to in the morning um, with people I didn't know. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know who I was with. I didn't know what I was going to tell my husband. I'm married with a child of where, why I couldn't come home last night. It, I was, it was incomprehensible demoralization. And what do you think I did as a, uh, and I was scared to death of getting pregnant. What, what was my solution? I was 30 years old. I went to my doctor and I said, I need you to tie my tubes. She said, you're so young. I said, I don't want any more children. My husband and I are both, you know, finished. And so I had my tubes tied so I wouldn't bring home a stranger's baby. I didn't say to myself, Deb, it's high time you stop drinking. Or Deb, you can't safely drink in a bar. I don't know how many times, this is why I say, no matter how far down the scale I've gone, I just kept going home with strangers. Anything could have happened to me. I could not stop it. And when I was drunk and sitting at the bars with my friends before it got too far gone, I was there arrogant and telling my best friend's secrets to strangers at the bar. Oh, yeah, she's having an affair with so-and-so. <laughs> I lost my friends. I lost so much in my life. Um, anyway, my life was so, I was always feeling so hopeless. I didn't realize that there was a solution out there. I'd never heard of AA. And I was in so much pain. You know, I couldn't, you know, King Alcohol won. Every time King Alcohol won. And I couldn't do it anymore. I was tired of having to have to drink every day. It was a, 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 the most horrible life I've ever had. And so my solution, again, the only thing I can think of at this point is to try suicide. And though um, I don't have any um, drugs in my house because I was strictly an alcoholic, um, there wasn't any like real drugs to, to, to take and, and um, kill myself with. So I had to... <laughs> I had to use ibuprofen. I had one bottle of gin left and about 500 or 100 um, ibuprofens. And I said, dear God, I pray that these ibuprofens, if I take them all, will kill one of my organs, my stomach, my liver, my kidney, something where the damage is so irreparable that I will die from it. That's what I said to myself. And so I started drunk dialing. 
And the first person I called with was my mother. And I said, this is your fault. I'm dying because you're an addict. You didn't know how to love me. You didn't know how to take care of me. And, and then I called my husband. I said the same thing to him. This is all your fault because you don't know how to love me. And then I called my friends and told them that they weren't there for me. Someone read between the lines and they called 911. So <clears throat> in come the paramedics into my home. With them is Effin Lurch and Effin Peewee. I cannot get rid of these cops. They're always with me. And the minute they walked in, I said, this is your fault because you interfered in my marriage. You know, it was, I, I pictured the call coming out on the radio and these two cops saying, oh, we'll get that one. You know, like, oh, we're going back to Debbie's house. Uh, and so I blamed them. And I looked at this sweet face uh, of the paramedics. And I said to him, I'm so sorry. I'm not going with you. I said, I know the law. You can't take me unless I go into cardiac arrest. So you might as well leave because I'm not voluntarily going with you. I am determined to die. Effin Lurch is a very smart cop. Yes, he is. He knows my belligerence. And he, as I was laying in the bed, put his face close to my face I don't know if he was going to tell me something or what, but my reflex was to punch him in the jaw. I don't punch cops. That's not me. And uh, he goes, he puts handcuffs on me and his partner's putting ankle shackles and he goes, goes, guess what, sweetheart? Now we can take you. And so they took me off to a psych ward who sent me to a rehab. And when I got there, someone said to me to please read the doctor's opinion first before I read anything else. And I cried when I read it because I saw what was wrong with me. You know, spending 28 days there, not having to have to drink was so peaceful to me. I felt so good. Each day felt better and better. And, you know, they told me that this was a spiritual program of action and that I had to find the needed power. I needed a spiritual solution for my malady. And, uh, the day that I left, they said to me, you have to go to a meeting. I left in like the afternoon. It was Mother's Day of 1993. He said, you have to make a meeting tonight and get a sponsor. And I was so happy to do that. I went to that meeting. I put up my hand. I said my name and that I just got out of rehab today and I need a sponsor. And a woman came to me after the meeting and said, would you like to go for a cup of coffee? Her name was Lori. I didn't know Lori was bi-coastal. Um, when she was in New York, she was a part of the Atlantic group. And when she was in, um, she lived in Santa Monica, she went to the Pacific group there. And um, Lori told me about herself. And I started talking to her a little bit about me. And uh, she brought up God. And I just put my hands up as if like um, I was a vampire and you put garlic in front of me or something. And uh, I said, I don't believe in God. I didn't believe in God because what I forgot to tell you in the beginning was when my mother came home from rehab, she wanted to go right back to using her pills, which we hear that all the time today in AA, people picking up a bottle or whatever when they leave rehab. And uh, she said she wanted me to go back upstairs. And, and in whatever seven-year-old little voice I had, I told her why I couldn't. And she picked up the phone and she said, I'm going to call God to see if you're lying. And she was talking on the phone and she looked at me and she said, God said, you're lying. So that I had no God after that. I thought I was an atheist and I was blaming God for something my mother did. God didn't do that to me. Human power does that, not God. So um, she said, do you believe that I believe? And I said, yes, I can do that. And she said, that's your mustard seed of faith to make a beginning. And uh, this was our routine from the second day that I was with her. We'd go to a meeting in the morning. Lunchtime, we would go back to either her place or mine, and we would read the book together, and she would explain things. In the evening, um, I would go to my home group, which she picked, because I don't drive and it was four blocks away from my home. I still don't drive. <laughs> um, I always rely on the kindness of strangers. Um, 
But yes, yeah, so she said to me what meetings I had to make. Every day had to be a different one. Beginners meeting, closed meetings, open meetings, big book studies, not big book meetings, um, step meetings, um, and tradition meetings, whether I understood what was going on or, or not. And uh, she would explain what each kind of meeting was. Um, and then she also had me doing service immediately. I don't even know about business meetings yet. This is day two. She put me at the door and she said, I want you to say hello and welcome everyone that comes through the door. And I thought she was having people spy on me. I really didn't understand the whole greeting thing. But as you guys know, who know me from this meeting, I love greeting. I greet every time I'm in a meeting, whether it's my meeting or not. Um, I believe that the, that first smiling face that you see makes you feel that much more comfortable walking in the door because it's a hard step to walk in through the doors of that day. Um, and so my first commitment at a big book uh, at the business meeting was to take reading. And then my meeting was in a church that was a full city block wide and they had this huge gymnasium in the basement. And we were about 200 members of this group. And I made, I call it a foolish mistake, but it really wasn't foolish. I said I would do set up. Set up required me to be there a couple of hours early before the meeting started. We made three huge urns of coffee and one big pot of hot water. And we set out the cookies and every single chair had to be placed on the floor because the school used the gymnasium every day. So we had to put them out. But what was nice, it was the meeting before the meeting, that chance I got to talk to other people in my home group. I love that. Same thing with setup. I loved it too. I learned about Rule 62 when I had my first night of my commit commitment to um, shut down the meeting. <laughs> After all the chairs were put away and all the coffee pots were washed, the guys in my group that were on cleanup with me Gave me a mop. Now, remember, this is a gymnasium. They gave me the mop and they said, okay, now you have to mop the room. So I went into the very corner of the room, not looking at anyone, and I'm crying. I'm never coming back here again. I can't believe they're making me mop. AA stinks, stinks. Oh, I'm not coming back. And then they said, stop. We're just kidding. We're just trying to teach you how to wear life like a loose fitting garment. You know, rule 62, you've got to make fun of yourself too. So that was a great, um, that was a great lesson. Um, so I have to tell you what I looked like when I came into AA in 1993. I had big hair. Imagine this, but up here. <laughs> I wore low cut tops, spandex pants, thigh high boots. I was a mess. I always came, also came into AA with a husband and a boyfriend, to which my sponsor started to talk to me about sober behavior. Um, so she said I needed to get rid of the boyfriend. I didn't want to. And being a smart ass, I said to her, you said no major changes in the first year. <laughs> well, I did listen to her. Um, and um, I did get rid of that boyfriend. And I did start dressing differently. I had no self-esteem. I wanted you to like me in any way you could. So it was either my out, it was usually my outsides. And I also baked cakes. Friday nights were our open meeting. I start by baking one cake. Um, and then it got to the point where I made, I was baking three cakes every Friday night and a man in the meeting, an old timer said to me, it's going to come a day when you won't feel you have to bake cakes for people to like you. I really loved what he said that. And, and that was true. Um, you know, uh, Lori told me I had to pass it on. So as soon as we were done with the steps, um, I think we were in step nine when I was starting to uh, sponsor other people. And I had a couple of sponsees. And, you know, life was going on and everything seemed great. And after 12 years, I relapsed. I slowly moved away from God and I wasn't even aware of it. I didn't even know that was happening. I stopped all my spiritual practices in the morning. I stopped talking to God, praying to God. I was very vulnerable without my God. So when I got a resentment, I relapsed. 
So for six months, I was blackout drunk again. I was living with my daughter. She was 27 or 26 at the time. And I was coming to every part of the house. I was a mess. And one day she sat me down and she said, Mom, I want you to watch this video. It was a video of me in a blackout in my underwear only. And I opened the refrigerator and I opened up the vegetable bin, which is the crisper if you're from the UK. And I urinated in it. When I saw that, that was it. I came back to AA the next day. I got very busy with loners because I joined this Facebook group, uh, a private Facebook group, although I don't know how private they really are, where people were putting up messages. There's no meetings in my town. I want to get sober. I need someone to take me through the book. And so I started being that someone. I started reaching out to them and we were using video messenger. So this platform was no big deal for me. No big deal at all. Because I had already started reading the book with other people. I read books with a woman who lived on a farm in the UK where she was just surrounded by farm animals. She was really far from town. She could not get to a meeting. I was working with an Inuit from Alaska. That woman spent her weekends in jail because they had no hospitals or detox. You'd have to take a helicopter to get to one. I've worked with so many different kinds of men and women from all over the world with using video messenger. And I was doing good. I redid my steps. I had to recreate my life again in step three because God gave me a blank slate again. Uh, I did another fourth step for all the people I harmed from my um, during those six months that I was in relapse. I did steps five and nine, and today I live in 10, 11, and 12 in those spiritual principles. Every morning when I wake up, and this comes from someone else, it's not mine, um, it's not original, and nothing really is original in AA. I say, God, get into my head before I do, and then I start my spiritual practices in the morning. I read 86 to 88. I do a guided meditation. And I get a divorce. Every morning, I get a divorce. I divorce myself from self-pity, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And I always ask God to put someone on my path that I can be of service to. And you know, God listens. That's <laughs> why I have so many sponsees. God listens very well. I'm a service geek. I'm a cheerleader for AA. I love AA. I feel incredibly blessed that we have this platform. I made so many friends and I started going back um, to conferences uh, in person in January of 2022. So I got to meet a lot of you in person. And that was my thrill. Every time I met one of you, it was thrilling. Um, you know, and I also got to sponsor people with over 25 years of sobriety, 30 years of sobriety, because um, they came to me and they said, I never opened a big book. I got sober on the 12 and 12. Could you help me? So it's anyone that's sick and suffering. So when you're going to sponsor people, it's not just newcomers. Think about all those other people that are, you know, silently sitting in meetings. You know, my purpose is to greet God's kids at the virtual or brick and mortar door. That's my job. And I can help another alcoholic because I'm armed with the facts about myself, which I learned from the doctor's opinion and the rest of this beautiful big book. My great, great, great grand sponsor was the beautiful Ms. Liz B, who passed away this year with 69 years sober and 100 years old. You know, she was a blessing in my life. I met her in 1993. And somehow um, when I got back, my sponsorship line changed. And she became my great, great grand sponsor. You know, and I stand on the shoulders of giants. And uh, what Liz says at the end of every single meeting when she shares, she says, without you, there is no me. And that's the truth. Thank you for allowing me to speak at your meeting. I'm truly blessed. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.